How you doing, Glenn? The man, the myth, the legend. <laughs> no, I wish. I'm, I'm trying to get there. Yeah, how are you this morning? I'm doing great. Yeah, no, I think it's, I think you're well on your way. I think you already made it. The founder, oh, wow. the founder, executive director of Men of Influence. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank Check you. that out. <laughs> yes, it's been a journey. Yeah, I'm sure it has. So you specialize in mentoring youth and reducing violence by saving one youth at a time? Yes. That's our motto. Um, yeah, we definitely try to um, get at high-risk youth. Um, we try to make them not become at risk at all. That's our goal. But um, yeah, we definitely have a challenge in doing so. Yeah. Yeah, well, we'll definitely get into that later on. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a website. It's www.menofinfluence.org. Yes, men of influence is with an S. Plural, um, got it. Yes, um, yes, that's the website. Um, you can find our um, past events and up and coming events that we're doing to be in the community involved with um, trying to educate folks on the COVID and um, passing out PPE, masks, gloves, sanitizer, um, and also some good hot food. Yeah, so we try to do that once a month. Everyone loves a nice warm meal, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's, I'm a little chunky myself with, uh, I always want some more. <laughs> what kind of food do you guys serve? Um, we serve home-cooked food. Um, we serve spaghetti. We serve baked chicken, um, string beans. And it just depends what um, the cooks have in mind. But um, we try to be health conscious, but a lot of times we put a little bit of um, soul in it. So, yeah, it could vary. Each time it varies. We'll have a feeding this Saturday coming um, on the 3rd in West Oakland um, where we're trying to... Um, service that community yeah spaghetti and chicken sounds good right now i'll tell you that yeah <laughs> yes yes and so men of influence was established as a non-profit in in 2014 is that correct uh it, it was established in 2013 um I'm sorry, I have a, 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 a co-worker who had a bad experience yesterday. He's in intensive care, and they just told me he's doing better. Uh, so I just wanted to... Okay. That's all good. Yeah, I, I, you're, you are definitely a man of influence. <laughs> <laughs> and so that your, your type of work and outreach is needed, I'm sure, on a weekly basis, 24-7, right? Yes, that it is. Um, it, it's definitely hardly ever a dull moment. It's always a new challenge. Nothing never duplicates itself. Um, it's definitely rewarding. Um, sometimes it gets a little edgy um, for myself, even though I've been working in this field um, quite a while. Um, I started working in this field in 2011, but um, yeah, creating men of influence came from some situations that did happen in the street. And I don't know if you want me to elaborate on that right now or. Yeah, uh, just just a few more points I want to mm -hmm. go over, but we'll, we'll definitely get into, into that. And so, yeah, I you have what is basically the MOI program. Can, yes. can you elaborate on that? Well, the MOI program is um, it's something that I see was missing in the community as far as um, when I was in the streets, we had men who had a lot of influence on certain sectors of the town. 
So I, I, I got with a lot of folks that were these people and just asked them to start speaking up, um, not to be a part of an organization. It was never meant to be an organization. I called it that and just wanting folks to do their part in the community. And, um, and that's what MOI means still today. A lot of folks that aren't a part, I still ask them to utilize their influence with the youth because a lot of them are uncles, dads, grandfathers that still have this influence over our new youth and they need not sit around and let things happen. And um, it's still having caught on like I want it to catch on or like I thought it would. But um, yeah, we need a lot of more, a lot more MOI in our community as well as um, women of influence too. Um, but um, starting in the work, I've seen so much missing in our community. And it's, it's, it's sad to say because it's, it's mainly in our black community. Um, all other races pretty much have influence, influential positions that the youth listen. And I feel like the Black community is well behind. And those are some other things that I'll talk about later in our interview. So with the, with the Men of Influence program, what are the different, I guess, services that you offer so i i know there's mentoring do you offer like legal ed education workshops do you offer restorative justice practice you know what types of services does the moi program offer so what i consider moi is where brokers um i have a bunch of affiliates that does have these channels um we deal with East Bay Community Law Center, which they we've done a lot of work with them with our youth. They can take on our youth if they get in trouble. Um, they want to be the first ones to have hands on when a, a juvenile gets in trouble. So that's a great service that we utilize. And um, it's MOI find what's necessary for that youth, what that youth may want to be involved in. We, um, of course, we, uh, I work with Youth Alive on the violence interrupter manager. And at Youth Alive, we have a bunch of services caught in the crossfire, teams on target that will channel some of our youth in there, depending on their criteria, what they fit. Um, we utilize youth radio for youth who want to be involved with media. Um, Snap Judgment is another affiliate. We use them um, when youth want to be involved. They, um, they teach, well, they have taught some of my youth. They teach them, um, they do many episodes and they they have these episodes on the air and I've had a youth that just went wow once he went in that room and seen all the things that they do and um, he was a part of their program for a while and um, it's that was more of a kind of like a TV based on radio um, type program. Um, we have Oakland Unite, which is part of the city of Oakland. They have a many of services uh, for us. They have um, case managers that does, um, they, they help you get into program apprenticeships, um, job readiness training. So all of these things, and, and it's a many other organizations, I, I can't name them all off the top of my head, but what we do is the men, men of influence staff, we have to sit in orientations to see what they offer these youth, um, just to know where we're going to, to send this youth to, because a lot of times we used to send youth into programs and we had no clue, we just word of mouth and we didn't necessarily know what it consisted of. 
So we have to sit in all these orientations of all these organizations that I work with. So I know exactly what I'm asking of the youth and I know exactly what I'm asking of the organization to apply to the youth. So, um, cause we've had youth come back and be like, oh no, that's not what I wanted. So to save time on everybody's face, we do orientations as if we're enrolling in all these programs. So it does save time and um, it's a form of no more excuses as far as MOI staff. We wanna make sure that this youth get exactly what he's looking for and he should not have any excuses for being successful in any form that he wants to be involved in. So that's why we do the orientations. But yeah, we broker um, we broker what the youth need. Yeah. So essentially you sit in these different meetings and orientations to see the needs of the youth and the different service providers you can transition the youth into. Yes. Because as I said, we've had situations where um, a provider may may say you can send youth to us and we'll do a b and c but we sit in that orientation and it may be a b and d and so that's what helps us be more prepared for that youth if we can tell him c is missing and he might be oh no i need c too and then we'll have to figure out a different program but um just sometimes when we have a a, a short conversation with a, a, a organization we might not get it all but in that orientation we definitely we know what they promise and we have a better feel of feeling good about referring this youth to that service uh, I feel like it gives a better outcome and nobody has no surprises about where they're going. Yeah, I think that's really cool because you're basically helping this youth discover um, not only their passion, but where they really need to be in successfully transitioning into adulthood. Yes, very much so. Um, and also, it's not just about the young men. Um, we um, even uh, work with Girl Inc., Girls Inc., and um, they have wonderful programs for the young ladies. And it's been times I've been in a room full of young ladies and had to hear their orientation, and um, they were welcoming to me coming. Um, but yeah, it's it's. That's our biggest goal is finding um, different organizations that will fulfill our youth needs. Yeah, it's, it's nice to hear that your program is gender inclusive. Yes, very much so. Because, um, yeah, we don't want to leave anyone out. And what's what's the turnaround? What's what's the success rate with men of influence? Um, and I how do you like, actually, more importantly, how, how do you measure that success? Now, that is very difficult to measure for myself because I'm not a data person. <laughs> so what we do is we get folks, um, I would say our success is 50-50. Some folks go back to the street. Some folks get bored. We have had folks that have been placed and started working. I've, I've seen our biggest challenge is home um, for a lot of the folks. We had a youth that we worked with for three, three and a half years. He was on the right path. And um, as he was turning 18 and getting ready to graduate, him and his mom started having real bad conflict. Um, now, if I was to measure our part, I would say it was successful for those two to three years. But 
it's like sometimes we don't have the funding to keep holding on to some of the youth and we can only monitor for so long but some of these folks the majority of them i get attached to one way or another whether i'm personally working with them or one of the staff is working with them and when i found out he ran away from home he stayed in oakland and he he ended up in Vallejo and, and, and he stopped taking my calls and um, I got one of our affiliates to contact him. He was okay. I had to send someone out there at midnight to pick him up off the street in Vallejo because it's, it's so hard to watch all that go to waste for him. And um, yeah, it took a bad turn. Um, He's back on track now, but it's, it's, it was almost a relapse into that negative behavior. And um, those are the type things. So it, it become really difficult for us to measure, but we have had success stories um, where folks are working now, um, still in programs. Um, we try to monitor them as best as we can. I'm not so sophisticated with all those measures. Um, just since COVID started, we started a harder campaign of, of really trying to keep a hold of our youth um, and, and monitor them um, and make sure that they have the resources that they need. But um, yeah, it, it's really a difficult task. Yeah. Tell me more about that success. So do, do youth typically go to college after the program? Do they, you know, start working in corporate America? Do they start their own business? What, what's, what's the typical success like? Well, I haven't had anyone go to college yet. I have had people start working um, and start earning an honest living. Um, I think when, like I say, when this COVID started, it, it really did impact our community in a bad way. And a lot of youth just gave up because they lost their jobs and, um, just where it, it was a lot of variables that came into play. One youth was supposed to go get tested because he had been sick and I, I, I hate it so bad because he um, he felt better the next day and he never went and got tested and he ended up losing his job. And a few weeks later, he ended up getting shot. And it, it really hurt it to hear that he had been just lingering around in the street. And I'm still waiting on him to recover. It's been a, it's been over a month now. Um, I, I, I know he's doing better, but um, I'm, I'm really concerned about these type of measures that we go through with um, some of the things that happens in our community. Uh, it, it's really difficult, but um, I, I definitely have been trying to find avenues with um, some colleges to get some of the youth to start some of these um, junior colleges. Um, we did have one who started a junior college at Lane. Um, wait, yeah, Lane. Um, he did enjoy it, but he didn't stick with it. He did, he did start working. So um, it was bittersweet because the education always prepare you for the long run. And that's what we want to get more youth involved in is that long run. Um, which was something that I missed out on was, I hate that I didn't, but I guess my path was already set um, to be where I am now. And sometimes success isn't always measured in, in the destination, like where the destination, you know, actually happened or where you're even, you know, heading, or if you made it quote unquote, success is also measured in just having that that support in the community and having that mentorship in the community and that's that's something that meta influence provides 
it provides that that family unity that that brotherhood that sisterhood and that um that refuge that a lot of youth are, are are seeking and that alone can be a success because if if we're if you know if if the mission is to steer youth away from you know the wrongdoings and um you know the challenging upbringing and bring them in under your wing and sort of guide them and mentor them that's a that's a success in and of itself definitely so yes um we were um finding i worked with orimi which is a county program and they have um foster children they have children just that are battling situations at home and <clears throat> it was a very um a good program they lost funding um i think in 2017 or 18 and um they had to do away but they would um they would um match me up with youth and it was rewarding because you would get these youth at a young age and um it was really it it was it was really rewarding for me um but it also became a challenge because you you, you get so attached to these youth you, you just want to help all of them and sometimes the youth don't want to go home and, and and that's the biggest thing i i, I found out and when i first started working period in the streets um was that a lot of our issues start at home with our youth and <clears throat> sometimes it's the parents not being accountable and on many of cases and you can't go through life always <clears throat> telling the youth that it's okay and defending them when you know that they're wrong and when our youth grow up with that with that motto that they're never doing anything wrong it becomes a disaster in the long run and, and that's just not fair to that individual to grow up feeling like they can never do nothing wrong and and so yeah i, I get disappointed with a lot of parents um when they don't even take accountability and it's difficult um and I, I my dad told me a long time ago never chastise no one else's kids and sometimes it's difficult as being under the moi flag is those are the things that we're there for to tell you when you're right or wrong not chastise them but really teaching and Sometimes they might get offended and they go back and tell their parent and their parents feel like we are the villain. And you know, it's those are the things that matters in life. It's always being honest. And um, I think that embeds those um, values in your child. And I think that's something that's really missing in our community is parents being accountable for their children and letting their children know when they're wrong they're wrong and it, it <clears throat> excuse me it's a repercussion for it being wrong you know so sometimes they go through life and can be caught red-handed and feel like because they got caught that was wrong no that wasn't wrong you were wrong for doing whatever you were doing so i think those that's one of our biggest missing conception in in our community you know we we I've, I've seen some bad things really bad things happen um in this field um where a guy got caught um they stole some things and then one of the guys stole from the group and they shot him. They shot him bad. And he felt like they were wrong, but they were all fighting over something that wasn't theirs. So 
it leads into a whole nother battle. Luckily, we were able, we weren't able to defuse the problem, but we were able to resolve the problem by relocating this gentleman. And um, we see this far too many times. Um, we relocated so many people through Youth Alive. We relocated, relocated when we can't resolve situations, the other component is to relocate an individual. And it, it becomes so different because Oakland has changed so much and with the gentrification and, and, and with us relocating Oaklanders, um, it's, it's a whole different outlook on Oakland from when I was a child um nowadays so um yeah we try to save that face but it is it, it, it's very difficult with all these challenges that comes with the territory yeah yeah i think i think um the whole like holding parents accountable thing i think people at, are just scared of change people are comfortable of, of you know where they're at and they fear the unknown, you know, like what's going to happen if, if I make this change or what's going to happen if my boy, you know, goes through this, like what's on the other side of all that. And, um, it's really all about a leap of faith and Definitely. yeah, like with, with, with all that said, how do you or men of influence uh, get like ga uh, not gather, but how do you generate the youth to come into the program? Um, like, what's your marketing like? Is it all word of mouth, or you know, is there email blasts? Are there um, cold calls? You know, what's what's that like? The ma <clears throat> the majority of it is word of mouth, and like I say, um, community outreach. Yes, community outreach. We do those orientations and we make them aware of what our services are. So they will email us about a youth. Um, we've had um, some organizations that would feel like they have youth that are good fit for us. But our main focus was really being in the streets we were counting on we did a whole bunch of campaigning um early on um we went to churches we went to um health fairs we went to a whole host of things we gave presentations we went to schools um and we let we some of them let us speak to the youth we we spoke with um staff and we let them aware. So we always, we still do get calls from the community. That's what we count on is calls from the community because we always wanted to let them know to give us a chance before they call the police. We wanted them to know, don't put the youth in jeopardy of getting a record just give us a try. I mean, if nobody's life is at risk at this moment, give us a try first. Let us come in. Um, and we've had great relationships with schools. They will call us. Um, they call us from the smallest to the biggest things. We've had so much as adults smoking marijuana around the elementary school while school was in. We came, we cleared that out. We cleared the um, adults out, at least while school was going. That was a great success for the school. Um, we've come in, we've talked to you that feel like that's the cool thing to be out smoking marijuana all day around the schools. We don't want them to get the feel that that's life. So um, that helped in two, two different manners um, for the youth and the adults just had no concept of what they were doing. So to bring it to their attention, it helped. Um, we would get a lot of calls from just, we went into small businesses and folks would call us about um, 
folks that had an argument and they felt it was about to escalate, we would resolve those issues. Um, even elder folks called us about the youth not getting out their way when they're coming home with groceries. They just had no clue of respect. Um, those are just some of the things that we dealt with and it's um, some of some of these things are really challenging because the youth today are so different. But um, the least of faith just always have um, elevated for me. It's, it's, I've approached some pretty nasty youngsters, but once the talk starts, they respect it. You know, um, they just are not aware of the small little things that mean so much in life that can get you so much further um, because the elderly folks that did call is like, we call the police and they say they can't do anything. They haven't broke any laws. And, 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 and that was another thing why MOI was created because police aren't all bad. You have some that care, some don't, which is life. But, um, we wanted to be the police of our community. When you have these situations, let us come give it a try. And, you know, we can make them aware of what they're doing um, can cause a problem in their life for the long run. And just being rude to an elder, you know, a el the elders in Oakland put up with a whole bunch of stuff that they don't have to. And, um, it's it's like we do open eyes to our community to um, show some compassion, some respect for your elders, you know. So it's it's a whole bunch that MOI provides that I think are simple little items that should have happened at home. Yeah, that's a good point, and I think a lot of youth are lost well a lot of system involved youth are lost and they don't have the proper channels of, of, of mentorship and like you said it really does start in the house it really does start with the parents and for you know these minority groups I mean it's obvious the statistics are out there with with the parent households you know I, I don't even have to get into that but uh, you know a lot of them come from broken families and it really hardens a child. It really does ruin a child's upbringing. And maybe that's part of the of that defense mechanism when they first, you know, initiate into the MOI program. Um, maybe there's a trust issue there. Um, there's just a lot of laws up that they have, you know, unknowingly. And that's the sad part. They don't know it's happening to them, but you know, throughout, throughout their young years, they're, they're just a sponge to their environment. They're a sponge to this world and their interactions. But I, I think it's great work you're doing. It's, it's, you know, it's really about taking that leap of faith and, um, uh, being nurturing to that youth and, you know, causing them to trust you and, and, and your staff and you're doing, Great work, so much so that you even received the Oakland Citizen Humanitarian Award. Mm -hmm. Can you talk yeah. about that? Um, yes, thank you for your um, compliment. That's great. Um, yes, that was um, 2016. I was nominated um, for it. And I found out, I think the end of 2016, that I would be receiving the uh, humanitarian um, in the honor of love, um, Dr. Martin Luther King Award. And so um, that was something that I never anticipated was any publicity for the work that I did or that I do now. It was just, I'm still, I'm, I'm on a journey of redeeming myself from some of the things that I've found out about my own life that some of the things that was horrible and um 
in my journey of, of tearing down the community. And so I start really just driving really hard, no publicity. Men of Influence have been working um, so hard underground trying to get things resolved. And what, and, and also that was the first year that the violence interrupters had started in 2016 and I was the lead violence interrupter. And I really don't know what all it was that brought it to folks' attention to nominate me, but I was really um, into the work. I'm still really into the work. And um, we decreased, I'm not just saying us solely, but as a, a, a collaboration, we decreased violence a whole bunch that year. Um, and when they told me this, I, I couldn't point to one certain thing or two certain things. I just didn't know where it came from. And it didn't mean much to me, but when I got on stage and received the award, it, it hit me like, wow, folks appreciate the work and um, it is making a difference for folks to see this. And I'm still not a publicity type person. I'm not a great talker about the work, but um, I feel like I'm really good at doing the work. Um, but yeah, I received the award. And after I received the award, it, it, it hit me on stage. I got a little stage fright. And then I start really feeling the appreciation of the work and it only made me want to work harder and every day I try to make a, a, a new level of ex excellency um, in doing the work and trying to make a better impact on our community and um, I think I've been to every award that they've had since 2017. I, I, they always invite me back at the Scottish Rite um, in Oakland to um, come and, and I appreciate everyone in that organization and I appreciate um, the folks that they nominate because they're making a difference in huge ways that I hadn't seen in my life or paid attention to it. And um, it's a great feeling. It's, it's, it's definitely a great feeling um, to have gotten that honor. Yeah, so um, yeah, it, 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 it meant a whole bunch to me later in life um, to just be appreciated for something good and not something bad. And um, yeah, that I, I, I'm still proud of that moment now. Well, yeah, it's always nice, like re receiving an award like that and being recognized for your great work, just like naturally, right? It makes it just makes you feel good. And you really brought up a good point. You you were rewarded for something that you actually did did good, you know, and you were reinforced for that rather than being reinforced for something that you did bad. And um, right, right, yeah. So yeah. go on. No, excuse me. And I, I still hold that same standard. It's, it's like um, a lot of times, like, I don't want to put my work on the front line for folks to see. I just want it to make a difference. It doesn't hurt for folks to see. Like, um, we were doing a feeding a few, um, a, a month or two ago, I think, uh, probably a month ago. And we had it, it it made me feel the feeling that i felt in the beginning um there was some homeless folks came to get some food and they were like wow i'm glad you guys don't have cameras out because we feel like we're being exploited when folks come out and feed and taking pictures and, and filming us and it made me revisit my initial thoughts of how my first initial plan was was not to be public publicized i feel like a lot of people do do great work and whether they video or not that's fine but in my 
view, I, I don't want anyone to feel exploited. A lot of times folks want to hear some of our um, past clients or um, hear some of the success stories and they want to hear folks talk about them. I want to hear folks talk about some of their success stories, but I never pressure any of our past clients because I don't want them to feel exploited. But we have had folks come back and talk because I want other folks to understand that this is a, a program for them, you know, and sometimes it's really necessary. But a lot of folks that we deal with doesn't want to be on that platform. Some folks are wanted. <laughs> They're wanted and they don't want to be on the forefront, but that comes with that trust too, you know. I, I have asked folks in uh, if they decline, it's no sweat, and if they um, apply themselves to 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 tell their story, it's appreciated just as well as if they didn't do it. So, um, yeah, that's something I still stick with today is um, just making that impact in the community. Yeah, that's a tricky balance to find, right? But it is. But yeah, it, it really comes down to communication. So definitely, definitely. You 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 were also featured on the hood produces quality. Oh yes, yeah. And yes. and for those of you listening, it's an independent web series highlighting individuals who have overcome the misconception that being from urban areas hinders one's ability to succeed. And I, I want to ask you uh, just a couple questions of just a couple of things you said. Um, you said, while I was incarcerated, I was in a college of criminals. And in this college of criminals, you learn to be a better criminal. And the reason that stood out to me was because I have never heard somebody say that before. And it makes so much sense. It really is a college of criminals, right? And then you, while you're in and when you get out, you have learned to become a better criminal. But can you explain what you mean by that? So what I meant was like, I, I, I went to jail first as a juvenile and it was for receiving stolen property. Um, so when I get to jail, I see juveniles that's been going to the juvenile since 12 and now I'm at, I think I was 16, 17 and, and, and they're already in this jail mode, you know, and I'm not familiar with this jail mode. And so you have to suck it up and, and, and it's like they already have a program going and you, you you don't get a book telling you how to be in jail, but you have to learn fast else you become the prey. And so um, in seeing that, I was only there for three days, I think it was. And um, seeing that, you have to adapt fast. So you have to become jail savvy. And you have to, this is where you can't let anyone step over you. You can't let anyone take advantage of you. So you learn fast to become jail savvy. And so, okay, so I got past that for the weekend. But then when I go to jail, now you have, that was school at juvenile hall. But then when you go to jail, county jail, now you're going into junior college. And now these criminals have gang affiliation. They have all types of things. You can't just go get on a phone. You, you, you know, you can go get on a phone and you might end up being jumped by individuals or whatever. Luckily, I had some street savvy that I knew folks that were in jail that kind of guided me. But at the same time, it's other people that come in there that don't have that. And so, you know, you start fighting. And then once you start fighting, 
you have to figure out how to defend yourself. You have to figure out when you don't have support from the streets, you have to find out how you're going to eat because you always want to have a little bit of um, luxury in there, if you may call it that. You might want to buy your own canteen. So in order to buy your own canteen, you have to become criminalized in jail and you have to get savvy. So, you know, I've seen folks that came to jail with maybe just a weekend and end up having to defend themselves. Now they end up catching a case in jail. Now they're going to the penitentiary and the penitentiary is the big college. So I have had a, a, a stint in the penitentiary, which wasn't very long. It wasn't over three months, but when I made it to the penitentiary, it was a whole different ball game. And that's where if you let one thing get by you, everybody takes advantage. If you don't pay attention, so you have a kid that may have come in for stealing a car or maybe stolen four or $500 worth of grocery and doing some time when they're not a hardened criminal. But when they come out of that penitentiary, they, they're a, a beast. You know, and it's for survival. It's mm -hmm. not because they want to be this beast, but then once you come out of the penitentiary or even jail, wherever it may be, sometimes it's a horrible place and it turns people into really horrible people. And um, some people I've seen, I, I, I wouldn't even recognize their... their um, behavior from the time that I had known them in the past, their behavior is totally different. It's criminalized totally and institutionalized. And some people go to prison and they can't even function on the streets anymore. And those are the things that about um, jail, what I say about it being a college is because you do become a better criminal because a lot of criminal activity happens in jail. And you hear these stories and you hear how people got caught. You hear how, what they did and in, 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 in that, you'd be like, oh, well, if he got caught for that, I know how to do this better when I get out. And so it, it just somehow turned people into a, a bigger criminal than they were before they went in jail if that kind of explains. No, thank you. Yeah, it's funny how the system thinks that we send individuals to jail to correct behavior. But in reality, it just amplifies the previous behavior that, you know, had them end up in jail in the first place. Definitely. You get some, uh, um, as I say, some folks go, to jail for petty things and then they come out and they become the biggest criminal some of them make a lot of money and some of them don't um but yeah it, it, it's definitely a college you, you get to hear all these stories and some are true some are false but um it gets the wheel to rolling it's not like said to be a rehabilitation you, you know most people only thing they do is come out better criminals or bigger criminals yeah so it's not a lot to learn in there other than that yeah so recently there's been a push to shut down california's youth prison system i don't know if you're aware but they're i think they may have already passed it it's sb823 and that's the bill that they're passing to shut down the youth prison system. And I think it's going to take effect in July. Yeah, July 1st, 2021. So that's definitely a good start because there's been a push to, to have more restorative justice practices involvement with, with the uh, rehabilitation of system-involved youth you know that rather than there being a, a punitive system of of discipline and so yeah i don't know if you were aware of that but i know that 
that's definitely going to change the landscape of of uh, youth incarceration, and uh, it's it's definitely going to um, slow things down a lot in the, in that respect. Um, for adult prisons, I know they have programs where, you know, they have educators go inside the prison and begin the work from the inside out. So once they once individuals are released, they have a better frame of mind and um, just a better navigation system for society uh, once they get out and, and they in turn uh, might even know what they want to do after they get out in a more productive way. But what 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 do you think are some uh, are some other ways and alternatives to not so much make it a, a, a criminal college, but to make it a a college of um, more of like a learning environment and a, and a college of goals and uh, prosperity after the fact. So um, at Youth Alive, we were doing some groups with um, Oakland Unite at. Um, Camp Sweeney, that's Juvenile Hall uh, um, in San Leandro. So what we were doing, we were working with youth and we were building relationships with the youth. These are the youth that are at camp, um, maybe have up to a year in the camp, but some are ready to come home. And we were building relationships and, 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 and setting up resources for them when they come home. So. It was educational. Some youth were taking on the program, which I thought was really good because I know um, they ended up releasing a lot of youth from juvenile hall at one point period. And um, I thought that it was really, really good. But I think that that's the thing that um, as juveniles and as adults, they need meaningful programs that are working with individuals before they come home, lining up these resources and having them um, ready to reintegrate into the community with a positive aspect. Um, we ran into a lot of parolees that wasn't able to access the funding that they were promised. Um, that the state of California had for them. A lot of times that they wouldn't receive them. Why, I don't know. But um, we've seen that a lot of times that was their way of getting right back into the system because they had no resources. But I think if all these prisons, jails, juveniles were able to resource um, meaningful programs that really are having opportunities and for some of these folks to start being a part of those programming, whether um, folks are going to the prison to present these things and enrolling them in, taking them into these programs, I think it should be some kind of um, pipeline into them getting their feet wet with some of these programming before they come home because um, they have no running start when they yeah. come home. A lot of them are really just with their hands up um, and, and, and no clue. But um, I think, honestly, these youth learning, all individuals learning on, on, on being accountable and coming home to something really resourceful would help all, um, it would help the community as well um, to see our society getting into the work field and um, doing something really um, responsible. Yeah, yeah, in custody programs. Yes. We, yeah. we, we need more of those. Definitely, uh, because the opportunity is out out here um, in society, it's, it's just a matter of tracking them down um, and knowing what's best. And I don't think that they let enough people into the prisons to um, really be able to benefit from them. Yeah, exactly. One more thing I wanted to ask you about 
uh, when you were featured on that web series was yeah. uh, you have a conspiracy theory surrounding the ghetto. Could you explain what you mean by that? Well, what I mean is um, it's, it's apparent that it's, it's a bunch that goes on in our inner city, um, like right now, I feel like the conspiracy theory is the guns right now. We're, we're flooded with guns in the inner city. You have youth that have military guns. Um, we were doing a tracing of guns um, maybe two years ago. I, I was um, working with the um, Bradley um, Foundation. Um, um, and and we were finding that guns were going into a lot of gun shops all over the nation, and but they weren't they were missing, but they would go into these places, but all of a sudden they're missing and they wasn't sold, and so I just don't know how all these guns end up in the inner city as they do. Um, it's the same thing when uh, drugs was flooded in inner cities. It only affected the inner city. I was part of that drug thing in the 80s where I helped spread drugs throughout our community. I didn't see the damage till later. And it's like you can find anything you want in the inner city that's illegal. In the suburbs, if you get an inkling of some somebody selling some drugs, some crack, some heroin, it's shut down immediately. You got a hundred or two hundred spots that people sell drugs in the inner city, and they they just only they they take the people who use in the drugs. They may take the lower drug dealer, but they still keep letting them drugs flood into America to, to, to distribute to our inner cities. And it's no way that they could say that they can't stop it or do something about it, but I feel like it's a conspiracy for the inner city um, to keep being deprived of certain services because they feel like we're not worthy of it. And I think that's something we have to do better in police in our community is right and what's wrong is do better in our community. But um, yeah, I, I, I even seen where a documentary um, a few years back where they were, it was, uh, I can't think of who was the official that was saying and black families, they want to get rid of the dad so it wouldn't be a loving family. Um, I've seen these documents about in Berkeley where they had these zones where the Blacks could only live in a certain zone. It was the scrap of the zones. It's like it's been so many things and so many details that has come out over the years that we as people we need to really wake up and open our eyes. If we don't do better, nobody else would do better for us. But um, yeah, I really feel like it's a conspiracy theory that we're not worthy of a better life. And we definitely are, but um, in this conspiracy, only thing we see is we feel like we're our own enemies and, and that's not true. It's not true, and it's been the same thing since slavery. I'm not a, a, a great historian, but it's the same thing that I feel like we had in slavery, where they would put the Blacks against the Blacks, and it's pretty much what's going on now. Um, the Blacks are shooting the Blacks, and um, they're making it easy because and I, I don't blame it all on the system because I think it's some of our fault too, because somehow we're purchasing guns. You know, we have youth that don't even have a car, but they have a semi-machine gun. And it doesn't make sense. No, and, it doesn't. Um, 
it, it's horrible. You know, um, sometimes I just want to scream and cry about some of the things that goes on that um, we're caught up in. And, and, and it's so sad because some of the things that we as Black folks go to jail for, you see other races get a slap on the wrist. And and that's in the minority, and it's it's brown too. The Latinos get just as much time as blacks, and it's like it's just not fair. The system is so rigged up, and um, it's so apparent that things aren't the same in other communities. And um, it's it's I've been stopped. I've been arrested for things that I had no clue of why I was being arrested. It's like police come out and they can pick any black man or any Latino and say, you fit the description. And I've never had to fight a case that I didn't have some involvement in, but I've been arrested. I've been harassed. So I know what that feels like. And you have no power over these things. So it's like, just like I say, just like in slavery, if they pick you and they choose you to pick on, that's what they do. It's just not the same source that they do. They don't, they, they didn't give us due process. They would just hang us back then. But now it's a different kind of lynching that they're doing. And it, it's just not fair to our community, you know, and we can cry about it, but until we just really come together and make a change, things will still remain the same as they are, but we have to really make a change and quit fighting one another. I think the documentary you're referring to is 13 on Netflix. Oh, um, yeah. I and that's that the, um, yeah, so that's short for the 13th Amendment. And basically, there's a provision in that amendment that says, basically, slavery should not exist, and it does not exist only for um only for only for punishment and discipline uh within the jails there's that small little provision where it mm -hmm. says that um i'm not I, i'm not quoting it exactly because i don't mm -hmm. have it in front of me but that's pretty much what it says um and then when you talk about our minority communities being pitted pitted against each other fighting each other you know i hate to say it but that's that's all the working of white supremacy. Um, that's that's pretty much the goal is to have our communities fighting each other so that we never find that outlet of escape and being able to to um, end up on top. And that's that's really the tactic of the enemy. Um, and they're smart about it. I don't know if you read the headline or even saw the news where there was these random pallets of bricks being placed in different parts of the cities while the while the riots were happening during the Black Lives Matter movement. And that's that's all by design. It, it, it speaks to the guns and the and the drugs being placed in these in these neighborhoods and communities. There was literally pallets of bricks being placed so that people could use those bricks to throw them at each other during these riots. And there's so much evidence to this conspiracy theory. And, and that's, that's, that's another piece of evidence. I definitely seen it. And it's even the majority of the violence were kind of promoted by the supremacy. Um, when the federal officer was shot down while the rioting, rioting was going on in the um, federal building when they shot him. And that seemed to have been a white supremacist who'd done it. But all the violence and all the footage that I've seen was I've seen black folks trying to stop the two white people from breaking windows. And they were writing um, some stuff on the wall like Black Lives Matter, and they were tearing up um, property. and it was adding fuel to the fire, but it was looking like the Black Lives Matter was fueling this violence. And I've seen it 
since I've seen that and, 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 and you see the difference with uh, storming of the Capitol, it was two totally different things. And it's, it's so sad, but um, as we've seen, Donald Trump made a, a, a huge uproar since he was president with folks coming out and speaking their language. And um, just last night, I heard him saying that at the Capitol, those people didn't do anything wrong who stormed the building. And, you know, it, it, it's said every day that if those were some minorities storming that building, a lot more people would have been dead. Um, you wouldn't have to worry about too many people going to jail. But it's apparent it's two different rules, you know, and it's sad because it's right in our face. And those are the things that are so frustrating that we don't open our eyes to see what's going on in America. And it's sad. Um, it's footage daily where, you know, folks feel like um, it should only be a white America. And it's definitely not fair. And as we know, um, <laughs> the Indians was already here in America, but um, you'll never get a supremacist to admit that, you know, and it's just not fair um, with what's going on. So how do we make the best of it? We have to really come together and um, put up a fight because it can be won. It's not going to be won overnight. It's, it's a lot of work entailed in this a bunch. And I, I, I don't give up that it won't happen one day, but I will probably won't see it. Well, let's hope you do, because you, you, you put in a lot of, of, of time, you invested a lot of energy in, in creating change. Um, I personally want to be careful when I when I talk about the white folk, because yeah. I, I don't want to like make it seem like they're all bad actors, oh, no. because no. There, there, there are some good white folks out there. It's when ideologies become extreme that's where things really go wrong and that's where the supremacist actors come into play um so with this scope and what we've been sort of talking about in the last couple minutes it's it's really important to make youth and adults aware of the other forces that are at play and how they can interact with law enforcement, what they have the right to do and say, what they have the right um, to not do and what not to say. Um, yeah, so legal education workshops are definitely something that I believe is 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 needed in these in these uh, reentry communities and these system involved communities. Um, but I think yeah, I think our job as as um, change advocates and um, supporters is to lead them to water and, and, and mentor them throughout the way. Very true. And I also want to echo that too. I have some very good Caucasian friends and that are frustrated as I am. But yes, I, I, I didn't mean to imply that they're all bad, but it's it's a bunch of people in all nationalities who wants to see change. Yes. So what are, what were the lifelines you chose to change your life for the better? Well, um, I grew up in a good household. My mom and dad, um, it was six of us, four boys. I know five boys and one girl, but um, my dad worked hard and he embedded good, good, good values in us all. We chose to do wrong at some point in our life. But um, so what happened is um, my last jail stint was 2004 and I, I came out with four strikes and 
I um I just really I I was done with all the slick stuff and so I went back to those values that I was actually taught in our household and that's when the leap of faith took place I I, I just was like I'm done with everything I'm gonna just take this leap of faith I'm gonna try and do everything legitimate and right it took it took a slow a real slow dance but finally things start falling in place. Um, and, and just a quick story, I, I went outside of that faith and bought some CDs from a guy on the corner. And that even caused me problems because the CDs weren't any good. It was only $10 I spent, but I was really upset. And I had said, I told myself, I'm gonna just stay because free, and cheap is expensive so <laughs> i was so mad and i wanted to go back and confront the guy but i'm like no it's a chance this could go wrong we might get to fight and he might hurt me i might hurt him i don't want anything else to do so that was the actual view that showed me that i had stepped out of boundaries so I kept up with my faith and I kept doing it and things start getting better and better. And um, I started being able to help these youth and that was really an eye opener for me as I started really working hard on those values that I was taught as a young, young, young child until, um, Things just, I just hated my dad died in 2011. And I, 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 I was starting my transformation on a full scale, but he wasn't around to see that transformation um, in time. But I, I, I think about him every day and in every form of, of the work. Um, especially when I, I question some things about what do I do from here, it, it always runs back to him and his teachings. Um, and my mom also is a great person that she's still here and, and, and I can count on her supervision from time to time. But my dad was the one who really wanted us to um, to succeed in life because he came from Texas. He's seen the slavery. He's seen, you know, some of the bad things that happen in life. So he knew we had hurdles to climb, but if we stayed on this path, it would be okay. And, and so far since I've been on this path, um, it, it was rough, but I think if I would have started the path earlier, it would have been a different outcome. But I think things has fallen into place like they were supposed to now so yeah um so i just felt like um to follow those teachings that i was taught i know those teachings was 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 honest and good um and my faith uh, i have faith in god that like i say it's been a lot of challenging situations that i've been in on this righteous path that i'm on of 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 just having the faith. I've, I've been in situations where guns was drawn and I'm not saying I wasn't nervous because I was, <laughs> but it all fell in place and it all worked out. And it's been really, really a rewarding, a rewarding um, journey to just have that faith that it's going to be okay. And what were some of those teachings that your father taught you? Well, he taught us and those values. If, yeah, if we worked for it, we would earn it. If we earned it, we would we would if we worked and earned our money in a, a legitimate way, we would enjoy that reward better than if we were to have stolen it or anything. He always told us, if you feel like you need to steal something, you come talk to me and if we can't get it, I'll find a way. And so 
it was always his faith in no matter how bad it was, we could come through this without, he didn't say it, but without any criminal activity. And that's what I think he was imposing. The biggest thing on us is that um, he felt like life had been hard for him to provide for all of us, but it was rewarding because he never had to go out and steal. He never had, we always had food. We always had clothes clothes so it wasn't probably the designer stuff but we were never cold we were never barefoot we were never hungry and so um just in that example in itself was huge just to see that and um i think he he laid a path down for us to make it a lot easier for us to not have to struggle in our lifetime i got more so sidetracked with the street and for no apparent reason other than the fad in the inner city and so um yeah so I, I i i stick to those values now that you know sometimes it may get a little rough but it doesn't call for any criminal activity um things will work out just stick to the script of um keep service in my community. Um, things have been really well for me since. I've been really wholehearted in service in the community. Um, blessings come out of nowhere. I mean, especially when it's things for the community. I have people who come and get involved. They come and help support the, the cause, whether it's bringing a roll of paper towels to bring in boxes of food, whatever it may be, but it always seems to work out. Yeah, it, you know, your, your, your father really paved the way for you and the family. And they, he, he instilled these, these values and teachings into you at a very young age. And you were able to absorb that and take it with you along your life's journey. And, you know, that really speaks to the claim that uh, having parents um, and having a healthy relationship with your parents really does work wonders in just the way somebody experiences life. Because um, you have the mentorship, you have the love, you have the support, whether it be emotional, financial, um, the spiritual support. Um, but it really supports that claim that you make about, um, you know, it, it, it really all starts with the parents and it seemed like your father, along with your mother as well, were really your anchor to, to your lasting success. Yes, very much. So, uh, it, it, it was a real community when I grew up, um, you couldn't disrespect the elders, um, if, an uh, elder called home about me doing something wrong. I, I was definitely in trouble, <laughs> but um, you don't have that nowadays. And, and that's what I meant about our, our, our parenting today is so different where our, our parents are protecting the youth. But no, back then, a, 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 a elder word meant something. So yeah, I miss those values where, you know, it's um, lost for right now, but hopefully we re we restore it. And we all need a nice little butt whipping every now and then, right? Oh yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. Especially the kids of today. Yes, I think that art. I think that art is lost, <laughs> unfortunately. Is. Yeah. So, like, what what factors do you think contribute to youth being at risk? Well, I think it's the programming in, in these inner cities right now that aren't there. Um, when I was younger, we did have uh, plenty of activities to keep us um, active. Um, uh, I, I think the these games that the youth have are so violent um, is it's crazy because it's, it's 
of that I see if the youth are contributing, excuse me, if, if they, they wake up to violence, they go to sleep to violence, and then when they go on the streets, they duplicate the violence. Um, I just feel like it's not enough. Um, sometimes when I ride through Oakland, it's like a, a, a ghost town for activities. Um, you have a few recreation centers open, but you don't have the youth out being kids anymore. You know, it's sad. And, and that's another point to the parenting. But um, definitely when, when I seen when I was growing up, the town was active. We had jobs, we had factories, we had canneries. We had so many things that parents were busy, kids were being kids. Um, everybody were playing their roles. Right now, we don't have that. Um, we have parents being friends with their kids' friends and having fun with their friend, friend, with their kids' friends, drinking with their kids' friends, smoking marijuana. Those things are contributing to where our standards are right now, I feel. And especially with this COVID, um, it's really impacting our community. Uh, one of the worst things that I've seen happen so far in this COVID and I'm sure you may be aware, is the EDD. EDD caused so much havoc in inner cities around the nation that a lot of killings started happening over this EDD money. And a, a lot of people um, were scamming. I've seen reports of people getting up to a million dollars in EDD money. Um, a lot of people were being busted with 100 EDD cards and 200 and some thousand dollars in cash. So what that done is it started friction with folks that were um, in cahoots. And when the card got cut off, they felt like somebody had scammed them. This is another point that I was talking about when... <laughs> people are taking something that's not theirs, then they get mad about it. And so that caused a lot of violence. We've seen a big uptick in violence um, over EDD money. And I feel like that was such a curse. Um, even with this stimulus money, yeah. uh, I forget what state it was in, the guy killed um, his child's mom. She shot her killed her brother, killed one of the kids. It wasn't his kid. He took his kid and killed the grandmother over the stimulus money. And those are some of the hurdles that we have to get over. We have to quit wanting things for nothing. You know, it's, it's not do us. So those are the curses is trying to get these folks out of that mentality into wanting to earn earn your key um, legitimately. So I feel like those are some of the curses that I've been really, it's, it's really been so difficult because right now homicide is up 300% this year already. We're probably at 35 homicides when I think last year we might've only been, I don't have the statistics, I usually have them, but last year we might've been at 12, or 13, maybe 15, but well, that's, that's, um, 200%, but, um, just in February, we was up 300%. And so that's just in homicides. So I don't have the statistics on violence, but, um, yeah, the gun is such a hurdle for us because it's just so readily available to our community and it, it, it's really causing a problem. Yeah, I don't think COVID has helped at all. <laughs> Everyone's stuck yeah. in their house with all this pent up energy and they don't know what the heck to do. People are losing their jobs because of it. And there's a lot of mental health issues that have risen to the surface 
Yeah. It's like, what do you like? What are you supposed to do when those factors are all mixed into one? Um, so it's just sad that the homicide rate is the 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 homicide rather the uh, homicide rate is skyrocketing, you know, ever since this pandemic started. And going back to the point you make about like receiving free money, I mean in a way it really diminishes uh, core values that are really needed uh, to be taught to us. Um, we didn't have to work for that money. Um, the young folks are, are receiving that free money and like it's um, when they don't know what it's like to earn and how hard it is to earn because of all the hard work, they're not really going to, I mean, what do you do with something that you didn't work hard for? You're going to spend it in ways that um, are careless or reckless because you're not going to save that money. It's like um, you didn't really do much to earn it in the first place. So, yeah, no, it, it's it's um, it's sad to think about. It's sad. Um, a, a lot of people disagree with with. Uh, giving out free money um, because of the things that we're sort of alluding to. Um, what do you think could be some different solutions? Well, I definitely think that it, I feel like it was definitely a good gesture because people it was a good gesture, did yes. The money. Yes, but I think the way that system i i can't say because i don't know but i feel like they made it easy for people to be able to scam that money um of course and as you said when it comes easy it goes easy it 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 becomes that's the problem that we have now is it becomes such a easy factor to get money that you don't why would you even want to work to earn money if you can get it that easy. But that's something that folks don't understand. And that's part of our teaching is that when you don't earn it, you don't respect it, you know, cause you think that it'll keep coming but that well goes dry. And when that well go, when the well goes dry you have no other means, but now you can you're going to take money from folks and you're going to rob people and things of that sort when you have no skills but to be um, scamming. So yeah, it's definitely difficult. I, I just think that they they let that get so far out of hand and I don't know if it's still going on right now today, but yeah, it got so far out of hand that um, it, it ruined people's mindset that they don't have to work and that's not true and it, it, it makes the job even twice as harder now than what we were working on before COVID is trying to get people to understand because some folks that we were trying to work with didn't want that $200 stipend a month and <laughs> what, what is $200 when you get in a Two thousand or ten thousand dollars a month. It makes it. I don't want that two hundred dollars. You know, so it did change our our um, our work with some folks, and I get it. But um, in the long run, that's 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 not going to pan out. Yeah, I also think we also need to create more jobs for our young people. Um, create more um, attainable jobs, make the qualifications less strict um, for especially the yeah. system involved. Um, you know, people need to understand that we're not perfect and we grow up in different environments and in different circumstances. And so those, those qualifications, um, I think they need to be less strict and um, businesses need to understand. Um, sometimes we just go down the wrong, the wrong route. Um, but people are willing to change. P def yeah. People are definitely willing to change. So, 
I'm I'm a part of the Oakland Frontline Healers. It's, it, it it consists of maybe 18 organizations. So we created well, one of our founders of Oakland Frontline Healers, Daryl Adams. He he um brought all the organizations together. And what happened is these organizations offer opportunities to our youth. And I've had several youth that engage in some of the job um, job openings that they had available is passing out PPE, is taking PPE to different sites. Um, it's a lot to do with COVID education. Um, testing, even vaccinations now. So they're offering opportunities up under the Oakland Frontline Healers that really do help individuals who really are trying to be prepared for when COVID is over. And it's a great resource for our youth um, to engage. Some jobs last longer than others, but um, it's definitely um, some training to be involved in the community. And uh, a lot of times when I see youth able to, to give back to the community, and, and even though they may be some of the, on their way to be a hard criminal, that really changed their heart to see the community happy and appreciative of you doing a, a, a nice gesture, you know, to um, service your community. And so, um, that's something we try to engage the youth into um, some of the volunteer work that all these organizations does. And of course they get paid for it. Not always do they even know a stipend is coming out of it, but when they get it, they'd be like, wow. And that's a great feeling to see a genuine smile where they get some money and don't have to look behind and see if anybody following them <laughs> because they've taken something off someone's Yes, or out there register. So it's it's honestly earned, and it's honestly appreciated when they earn that money. Yeah, there's a lot to be learned, whether it's volunteer work or even work, uh, your 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 typical nine to five. You know, you learn time management, you learn respect, you learn customer service, how to talk to people, communication. Um, you learn all these different types of things. And it can really teach you a lot. It, it, yeah. it teaches you a lot than sometimes even uh, general education teaches you. Definitely. And, and we had a program that, well, Oakland Unite had a program every summer. We would work at two to three different parks. Um, and they would encourage us to bring you um out so some of my moi use that i would have i would bring out and they would meet police they would meet fire department they would meet um it, it was like a health event every every saturday or every friday and it would be food everything and you know i would let them interact and you know some of them really took to some of those police and some of them even wanted to become a police um after interacting because a lot of times our youth only interact with the police when they're detaining them or something bad has happened and just to kind of some of those learnings really opened up eyes to what some of our officials really do on a different level that's not official you know and those are some things, you know, that that were really helpful to our youth. We've even gotten some youth that, because um, the mayor would come out and um, they would get into the mayor's program. Um, I forgot what it was called, but it was like a um, internship mm. that they would work with the mayor. They would take so many youth that would, yeah, they would work with the mayor during the summer. Um, and it's it's just so many stories. Um, the mayor supported me every year. The mayor's office with toy drives. We 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 give out toys and and turkeys. Um, the mayor always helped 
their office always helps with the uh, um the toys and um the city always helps us with the turkeys and um other organizations but yeah all these things i try to embed into our youth that even though i'm not anywhere in the political world it doesn't mean that the politicians are bad because you may see something on the website or something on the news, but everybody makes makes an impact somewhere that's good. So I, I just want sometimes I want the youth to see if they can be anything that they want to because as a youth, I never even knew who the mayor was. You know, I never thought that I would want to know, but these things um I think in our youth eyes to meet a mayor, to meet a politician, to meet the governor, we've been in front of the governor um, when Jerry Brown was in office, that, you know, it can enlighten your mindset on some goals. Because all we see is um, in our community is bad activity. So yeah, to get a youth to just kind of see some things, it's, it's, it can be mind blowing. That blows my mind at 58. <laughs> Sometimes my mind is blown at some of the things I see. And um, I don't regret what I missed out on, on being on the straight and arrow, because I don't think I would appreciate it as well as I do now. But um, I definitely don't want others to miss out on it. Um, at a young age. So I feel like my purpose is here for a reason and I'm trying to utilize it to the best of my ability. Yeah, like in that political spectrum, it'd be very, very nice and interesting to have youth participate in like, you know, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Um, City council meetings, city board meetings, and just being part of the know and understand what's going on in your own city. Uh, the very place that you live in. Um, And that'll sort of open the gateway of like, okay, like, you know, this is, you know, this means that and you know, this, that and the other when it comes to politics. And then next thing you know, when the youth that youth is eligible, they're going to start voting, and how much of their vote and their voice really can make a change. So no, yeah, I think it's very important to expose uh, youth to you know, the different, uh, like the different politics and like the different sides of politics and how it could really benefit and work in their favor. Yes. I, I, I held a, um, a focus group in 2019. It was really interesting, um, because the community that I had come out, um, they talked really bad about that city council in that area. And I was like, so, you know, we have had, we have taken youth to city council meetings and none of my youth have ever spoken, but we've had youth speak on situations that they didn't like and what they wanted to see happen. So that was a great point you brought up. But now these were adults that came to my focus group and I was a little irritated with, some of their thoughts because what I told them, I was like, well, you know, they have city council every Tuesday and you know, you can go down there. I was like, in most of these other districts, you have the community go down there and that's why their community looks like this because they go down there and they tell the city council what they want in their community. So I was like, if you feel like that, and also this city council, who they were talking about whole groups every Saturday at a church. And the reason I know is because I followed it. I seen this and I was like, wow, I never been involved in things to this degree. So I told those folks at the focus group, I was like, you know, they be here at this church every Saturday. I think it's every third Saturday. I'm sorry. But um, also, You can go to city council and you can see what's on the agenda. You can look at it on the website. But anyway, um, I felt like 
they should have that knowledge of knowing that if something isn't what you want in your community and you can go down and say something or you can even call your city council but for some reason the city council keeps being in the office because people are voting and maybe you're not voting but you do have the power as a community to make change and i think that's another thing that our community has a lack of education is about those items is 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 demanding what you want in your community and your vote does count in your community so um yeah it takes just a little bit of your time to make those demands and i think those are some of the things that we miss in our community that um why does north oakland look so nice nicer than west and east oakland because mm -hmm. i see those people at city council all the time and demanding i've been to all parts of oakland um what do they call them community meetings with their city council i've seen north oakland make changes overnight um i don't see very many people at west oakland's um city council's um, neighborhood um community meetings i see folks but they're not folks that are oaklanders that are there there are other folks that's come in on the gentrification but their neighborhoods are being changed so i mean you have a lack of communication with um the folks that need to be there if they want to see change yes yes that's very important to get involved and active with this political sphere. So what advice can you give to youth who are currently system involved and are struggling to successfully transition into adulthood? Well, my advice is to not get caught up in the fad of the inner city, really focus on yourself because at the end of the day, um, you can, start hanging out with gangs and groups of criminal activities, but it's, it's, it's not a real brotherhood as one would think. Um, so my advice is for one to really focus on being productive in life for yourself and your family and make the best of it as you can get an education, get some job readiness training and, and, and really enter this world for the win, not, not, not for a short run, but for a long haul. Um, because right now I think that so many folks are focusing on easy money, but, um, easy money doesn't last. And, um, I think people should take opportunities take advantage of these opportunities for the long haul, such as I said, the job readiness, education. Um, it's a lot of programs that are available to assist um, our youth, um, but the criminal world isn't, it, it isn't promised and it's, 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 it's a short haul. Yeah, that's my advice on that. And then what helpful tips or advice could you give to adults who are struggling to reintegrate into society? My advice is, is not too late to do the same thing, to get involved with education, get involved with job training, get yourself a job, start somewhere. Um, I'm a prime example. I didn't start working until I was in my later 40s and um i'm 58 now and I'm, I'm 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 still striving to make a difference in this world i'm making a living i'm not rich i'm, I'm not rich by far I, 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 i'm making it uh, i'm i'm eating and i'm still doing the work but uh, it's it's so rewarding to um take that leap leap of faith and um, get yourself into society in a positive manner. Um, 
because we have to do better if we want better. And it all starts with your movement toward becoming um, a productive member of society and quit hurting the community because, because we need you and we need you on this path to help with these up and coming youth to um, see you lead by example. And um, it's not too late. That's wonderful. And from you, I get the sense that it's never been about the money. It's always been about creating change, giving voice to the voiceless and being there to support these disfavored communities. That was my biggest thing. It was never about the money. Um, I just felt like I owed my community so much. Um, and as I say, the, the biggest reward for me is just seeing someone become successful and change their life and appreciate it whether they say thank you or not if i could just see that gleam in their face that they are living life happily without having to watch over their back or worried about the police pulling behind them or anything of that sort that, that's the biggest reward for me i i i want to see people live and really live um and be happy with life. We have so many people that miss out on life. Um, I've seen so many youth die before they are 25 and, and teenagers and everything. I've seen them pass without even having a life, um, being able to enjoy life. So yeah, this helping people live and see life in a different prospect is it's rewarding for me mm -hmm. glenn upshaw everybody founder of men of influence you could visit his website at www.menofinfluences.org and if somebody wanted to reach out to you would you like to give your email i'm sure uh, i have an email is is um, men of influences at gmail.com and uh, um, also um, the the um, I'm trying to think the other email is Bruce B R U C E Bruce U the letter U um, at live.com that's L I B E dot com um, I just started the men of influence um, email just recent um just this week so um because i've been having trouble with the bruce U email so um but yeah that's definitely a good um email to catch me at or you can um contact me through my website it has phone numbers and um emails as well on there so um yeah feel free to reach out um we would love to work with your youth or your adult um, whomever are, if you just want to call and um, say hi, it's fine. Now, do you go by Glenn or do you go by Bruce? I go by Glenn. Bruce was a nickname a long time ago that I received, and I've been using that email for years. So uh, either works, but yeah, Glenn is my name. But uh, yeah, when people see that email, they start calling me Bruce anyway. <laughs> It's fine either way. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for your time, Glenn. It's been an honor sharing this space with you. And thank you for coming on. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Pedro. I appreciate you as well. And um, I love your work as well. And thank you for having me. Of course. Keep up the good work. Fight the good thank fight. Thank you so much. Thank you. I will do. All right. Okay. Talk to you later. See you later. Bye-bye.